Well, hello and uh, good morning. It's my, my pleasure to be here today. As Sam mentioned earlier, my name is James Engel. And you might be wondering, well, who's that guy? And uh, if you don't know who I am, you may know my wife, Maggie. And uh, actually, what's, what's really cool is Maggie and I are coming up on our seventh year of, of marriage. And um, God's been good to us. Uh, actually, during that time, we've, we've gotten two beautiful daughters. One is Evelyn, who is four years old, and the other is Amelia, who is uh, two. And uh, so, yeah, it's been, it's been an incredible journey. And uh, so, with no further ado, let's begin. Uh, my sermon this morning comes out of the book of Ezekiel, uh, chapter 36. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to read uh, the passage for us, and then I'm going to do a, a prayer uh, for God to bless his word and to bless us who are hearing this. And then uh, we'll, we'll dive right in. So turn in your Bibles to Ezekiel chapter 36. We're going to be going verses, through verses 22 through 27. The, uh, the title of my sermon, while you're turning there, is God's Glory Displayed Through Restoration. That's God's glory displayed through restoration. Now in chapter 36, beginning in verse 22, this is what it says. Therefore say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, It is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am about to act, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations to which you came. And I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, and which you have profaned among them. And the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God, when through you I vindicate my holiness before their eyes. I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleannesses, and from all of your idols I will cleanse you. And I will give you a new heart, and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh, and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes, and be careful to obey my rules." So let's go before the Lord in prayer. Well, Father, um, I just want to pray that you would be honored here today, Lord, that uh, this message would be a blessing to those who hear it. I pray, Lord, the Spirit would come and, and help me in this task, Lord, to just be faithful and to proclaim the things you have showed me. And... Um, Lord, above all things, I pray you are honored. I pray that Christ would get glory, and I pray for your people, Lord, who right now are in, in, a, in a trial, all, all together too real, of being isolated and, and not able to gather together. And so, Lord, in these times, I just pray that you would help us. I pray your spirit would work. I pray Christ would receive glory. And all of our praise, all of our adoration, would be pointed towards you, Father. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So the title of this sermon, as I said, is, is God's glory displayed through restoration. Now, we find ourselves in the book of Ezekiel. And I'm aware of the fact that for most Christians, if, if they were asked, they, they would say that Ezekiel is an unfamiliar book. And really, this is because you don't often hear many sermons from Ezekiel or, or Bible studies from this book, but it's a very large book, and it's found in the Old Testament. And so with that said, I want to give a little bit of background before just diving right into chapter 36. And so here, here's basically what was going on. Ezekiel takes place during an exceedingly dark period in Israel's history. Israel as a nation actually wasn't in Israel. And you might ask, well, if Israel's not in Israel, where, where were they? Well, Israel was in, in Babylon. And you might ask, well, what, what was Israel doing in Babylon? Well, Israel was in Babylon 
Because through the prophets, God has always warned Israel that if they didn't return to faithfulness, if they didn't repent of their sins and turn back to a covenant people that obey God and follow God, that he would judge them by raising up another nation and using that nation as a tool for his judgment upon Israel. And so during Ezekiel's ministry, this is exactly what has happened to Israel. They are no longer in their land. Um, God raised up Babylon under King Nebuchadnezzar and used them as a tool for judgment and removed Israel from their land as captives. So at this point, they were exiles. But not only that, they also destroyed the temple, which for the Jews was a very significant thing because not only was that the place where they would worship, but this was also a symbol. It, it represented the presence of God. So Israel found themselves in a situation where they were no longer in the land that God had promised to them. The temple they once worshipped at is now destroyed. And they are experiencing divine judgment because of their rebellion. And so this is where we find ourselves in chapter 36. Here, in this chapter, God is given Israel a promise. A promise of restoration back to their land and specifically, he promises certain things that he is going to do in his people. And so chapter 36, in the midst of judgment, is a promise for Israel to hope once again. And so with that being said, another thing I want to point out about this passage is chapter 36 is not just a promise for Israel. Now, it's true that in the immediate context, uh, Ezekiel is addressing the nation of Israel. That's the immediate audience to whom he's speaking. And it's true that these promises apply directly to Israel. It was for them. But beloved, if that is all you see, if that is all you see is a promise here for Israel, you are missing a far greater reality that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. This passage is talking about the gospel. It's talking about the new covenant reality that would be purchased in his blood. And so that, that is an important thing to grasp as we head into this. So beginning in verse 22, look down with me. It says, Therefore say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, It is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am about to act, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations to which you came. So the first thing I want us to see here is God's making it abundantly clear that he is about to act, but it's not for their sake. You can see that right there in the text. And as a matter of fact, he states it again. If you jump down to verse 30, 32, it says the same thing. He says, it is not for your sake that I will act, declares the Lord God. Let that be known to you. So literally, God is saying to them, I am about to act, but it's not for anything found in you. And then he repeats it at the end because after he tells them all these awesome things he's going to do, he wants them to know, oh yeah, by the way, I am not doing this. I'm not acting because of any merit or any virtue or anything awesome that's in you. I'm actually doing this for my own glory. And that, that brings us to the second part of this. He says, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations to which you came. So why is God going to act? Why is he going to move on behalf of Israel? It's for the sake of his own name. It's for the sake of his glory that he is going to move on behalf of Israel. And this makes sense too because in the context of this passage, Israel's already experiencing judgment. So there's nothing in Israel to motivate God to act on their behalf other than to judge them, which he currently was doing through another nation. So this is very, very important. But we see another thing here. He mentions, he says that, which you have profaned among the nations. Israel was profaning God's name. Now this word profane means to defile, or it can mean to dishonor. Really, to get to the root of it, it means to treat God's name as common. I mean, let me give you an illustration. Imagine if you were to meet the president. Now, 
regardless of how you feel about the president, if you wanted to show any sign of respect, if you wanted to recognize his authority and give him honor and respect that is due to him, you, would, you could only address him in one way. It would be Mr. President. You wouldn't just walk up to him and casually be like, oh, hey, Donald. You wouldn't do that. And so Israel, through their actions, is doing the opposite of that. They're making a, a defilement. They're dishonoring. They're treating God's name as common by the way they were living. And this is really the opposite of what we see in our Lord's teaching on prayer. Now, if you remember when Jesus was with his disciples, he must have had an amazing prayer life because that was one of the questions they asked him. They said, Lord, can you teach us to pray? And in Matthew 6, 9, Jesus gives us a model for prayer of how we ought to pray when we approach God. And it goes like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. So right there, that word hallowed, it, it's it's describing that God's name is to be considered holy, that it's to be treated as a name above all names. And, and you are to live and act and have your being in such a way that God is honored as holy and greater than all things. And through Israel's actions, God's name was being profaned. Instead of being hallowed, it was made to be common. But now God's glory is going to be put on display through his people. He says in verse 23, And I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, and which you have profaned among them. And the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God, when through you I vindicate my holiness before their eyes. So God's glory is going to be put on display through his people. Now, I think we need to let that sink in for a second of what was just said. The glory of God is going to be shown. It's going to be put on display, but it's going to be put on display through the very people that were under his judgment, that were profaning his name. I mean, you want to talk about the song Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound God is going to save his people and he's going to do it in such a way that his glory is going to be shown through that people, the same people who do not deserve it. Now that is grace. But we have to ask, well, how, how is God going to put his glory on display through the very people that were defiling his name and dishonoring him? Because these people were unfaithful. They habitually committed idolatry. They, they refused to heed warnings sent through the prophets. In fact, it was so bad that when you read the beginning of Ezekiel, we find out that he was told by God that his ministry would be characterized by rejection. I mean, think of this. Imagine God coming to you and, and saying, oh, by the way, I'm going to use you as a prophet to the nation of Israel, but um, when you tell them to repent, they're not going to listen. When you tell them to return to faithfulness, they're going to reject you. I mean, how would you like to have... To have that ministry, we're basically right, right in the beginning. It's like, hey, this is how I want you to serve me, but uh, it's going to be a failure. So do you see the problem? How is God going to get glory for his name through such a backslidden, sinful, corrupt people who ultimately refuse to listen? How is he going to do that? Well, there are four ways God's glory is displayed through the restoration of his people that comes out of this text. There's four ways. The, the first way is separation. We're going to see the second way is through cleansing. The third way is through regeneration. And the final way is through indwelling. So that's separation, cleansing, regeneration, and indwelling. So the first way God's glory is going to be put on display through the restoration of his people is through separation. It's by separation. Look down with me at verse 24. It says, I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. So here God is going to take them, he's going to gather them, and he's going to bring them. But remember what I said before, this is not just a truth concerning Israel returning and reclaiming the land. 
This passage also looks forward to a greater day when God would take, gather, and bring people from every tribe, tongue, and nation and gather them together in Christ. It looks forward to the day of the gospel through the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. So this is what we need to see. And in the gospel, in this verse, there are two realities in separation. There's two realities. The first is there's separation from the world. And this is an external separation where God separates you from the world. The second is he also takes the world out of you. And that's an internal separation. So God separates you from the world, but he also separates the world from out of you. And we can see this in passages such as 1 John. In 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 and 16, John describes to us two categories. We see the love of the Father, and then we see a love for the world, and we see that they're opposed to one another. So he says, do not love the world, or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. So here, John describes to us and gives us a definition of what worldliness would be. It's anything that consists of the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life, or some translate it as, as pride of possessions. But the idea is this. Prior to coming to faith in Jesus Christ and being forgiven of our sins, we all live sinful lives. We all live worldly lives just steeped with ourselves. And what John's saying here is that if you love the world, if your life is, is characterized by walking in a pattern where your affections are set on material things, your affections are set on things that prosper you and focus how, how awesome you are and they, and they elevate yourself in the world, he's saying that the love of the Father is not in you. That's another way to say that you're not really a Christian. And so God calls the believer, through repentance and faith, God calls the believer to come out from worldliness. There, there should be a separation in your life. And this is one of the first ways we see the glory of God being put on display through his people, is that he separates his people from worldliness. He separates them from a life filled with sinful indulgences. And ultimately, worldliness, all it does is it places the gifts above the giver. It elevates things and positions and powers above God who is all above all. And so this is one of the ways in which God gets glory through his people is through separation. But another category in separation is we can see that God separates through discipline. In Hebrews chapter 12, verses 5 and 8, the author of Hebrews says this, and have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Now here, God is making it clear that if you can live a life where there's no separation occurring from sin and from living in worldliness, and you can just drift off into sin and the Father doesn't come and discipline you and put you back into a narrow way of life. He is saying you're illegitimate children and not sons. Let, let me give you a real practical example. Let, let's, say, let's say you had a son and uh, you told your son before they went to school, you said, look, I, you got brand new clothes on. And I know you like to play with your friends after school, but I don't want you ruining your clothes. So after school, I want you to come straight home. And your son says, okay, and they go off to school. Well, imagine the bell rings, they get out of school, and, and his friends are there, and they're like, hey, come on, let's go play. 
And in that moment of temptation, your, your son, knowing better, says, okay, and he, he goes off and plays anyways. Well, let's say now, after playing, let, let's say it's the worst case scenario. I mean, he's got grass stains, his, his clothes are torn, like they're just a mess. And, and his friends too, and, and they all come home. And you see your son with his friends, and in, and in anger, you tell his friends to go home to their parents. But then you turn to your son and you say, I told you not to play in your clothes. Look at you. Now you're in trouble. And, and, and imagine your son seeing this is, is almost like, well, well, that's unfair. I mean, you, you just sent my friends home. That they, we all played. We all got dirty and ruined our clothes. But you're disciplining me. Why are you singling me out and not them? That's not fair. And as the parent, you would just simply say, look, I'm not responsible for those other boys. Their parents are their parents, and you are my son, I am your parent, I'm responsible for you, and there's consequences when you disobey. And so any loving parent would discipline their children to correct their, their disobedience. And here we see that God the Father does the same exact thing. He will not allow a true believer to just walk in sinful rebellion in a continual pattern. According to Hebrews, God will come for you and he will lovingly discipline you. Or as he says, which all have participated, then, then if not, you are illegitimate children and not sons. And so a question I have for you is based on what we've seen here of the separation that God does in the life of a believer. Do people take note that you live differently? Is it apparent to people who get to know you that something's different about you? They may not be able to put their finger on it, but it's evident that you just live differently. Another question is, do you tend to swim upstream? And what I mean by that is, is, is let's say you're at work or, or you're with a group of people. Does everyone around you who is unconverted, that doesn't follow Christ, do they tend to go in one direction and you seem to always be going the opposite direction, singled out? Is, is your life marked by discipline? Is it marked by godliness? Or is it just filled with worldliness? Because this is one of the signs of being born again. God says in this passage, I am going to take you, I'm going to gather you, and I'm going to bring you to myself. There's going to be separation. And this is the first way that we see God's glories displayed through the restoration of his people. It is through separation. But there's a second way that God's glory is displayed through the restoration of his people. And that is through cleansing. Look down in your Bibles at verse 25. He says, I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleannesses, and from all your idols I will cleanse you. So here when he says sprinkle with clean water, this is really an Old Testament way of symbolizing the reality that we need cleansing through divine forgiveness. What this means is we're all born sinners. We all have sinned in various ways and we live lives filled with worldliness and sensuality to such an extent that in order to approach God in the Old Testament, you had to be cleansed. We are all unclean by nature and in order to approach a holy, righteous God, we need to be cleansed. And in the Old Testament, that was done through the sprinkling of clean water. There's a bunch of passages, but one passage that shows this requirement is in Numbers 19, verse 20. Here it says, If the man who is unclean does not cleanse himself, that person shall be cut off from the midst of the assembly, defiled the sanctuary of the Lord. Because the water for impurity has not been thrown on him, he is unclean. So there that's that same thing where they repeatedly would have to be cleansed because of their sin. But we also see a far greater reality in the Old Testament. There is, a, there is a promise of a future cleansing that would be a permanent cleansing. It wouldn't be like the old cleansing where they'd have to repeatedly get washed and cleansed and, and be purified to go before the Lord. They would once and for all be cleansed where their sins would actually be dealt with. And we can see that in the book of Zechariah, chapter 12. In verse 10, it says, And I will pour out on the house of David and inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy, so that when they look on me, on him whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and weep bitterly over him as one weeps 
over a firstborn. So this passage is, is, talk, this passage is talking about when Israel would see Jesus as the Messiah and they would mourn over him who has been crucified by their hands. But then when you jump down to the next chapter, in chapter 13 of Zechariah, verse 1, we hear on that day, what day? The day I just described. On that day, there shall be a fountain open for the house of David and inhabitants of Jerusalem, so, uh, and an inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and uncleanness. So there's a future day in which, through the work of Christ, dying on the cross for our sins and paying our debt, um, satisfying the wrath of God for us and being resurrected, showing that his death really did conquer sin and death once and for all, when we place our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, there is a fountain opened up in which we are now forever cleansed. It's a permanent cleansing, and it really does wash away all of our sins. And in this passage, God is saying that his glory is going to be put on display through his people in such a way that that cleansing is going to be a reality, and they will have a clean conscience. Now, in verse 25 it highlights for us two doctrines that we see in the gospel. Two doctrines come into focus, and that's the doctrine of justification and also the doctrine of sanctification. Now, justification and sanctification, these are married together. And what I mean by that is you can't have one without the other. They cannot be divorced. They are forever binded together. Now, justification is that doctrine that declares us to be cleansed from sin. It's literally a, a, a legal term which declares us to be in right standing with God. And the way this occurs is when someone repents of their sin, they turn away from their sin, they turn to God with an open heart and just confess, and they believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, they are justified. They are declared to be right with God. But the wonderful thing is not only does God treat you, or I'm sorry, the wonderful thing is not only are you declared to be right with God, but God then treats you as though you are right with him. And so justification is a positional righteousness. This is how God now forever sees you, is altogether righteous. No flaw, no blemish. He sees you as spotless, as altogether clean. But then there's that second doctrine, and this one's married to it, and that's the doctrine of sanctification. And this is a practical righteousness. Sanctification is the doctrine that refers to our growth and holiness. It's talking about how from day to day, God works in and through us as believers to make us more and more conformed to the image of his Son. And the way sanctification works is it works in the mundane. It works when you're going to the grocery store and you maybe have a lot on your mind. It, it works when an unexpected bill comes in the mail and you're stressed out wondering, how am I going to pay this? Sanctification works when you're singing praises to God, but it also works when you're experiencing trials. God uses all sorts of means to grow you into a righteous state. And so, in verse 25, when he says, I will sprinkle clean water on you, this is pointing towards a day when his people would be justified once and for all through the work of Jesus Christ by having faith in him. But then he says on the back end of verse 25, he says that you'll be clean from all your uncleannesses and from all your idols, I will cleanse you. So through sanctification, God is more and more going to remove the idolatry in your life. When we talked about separation just a moment ago, he's going to remove the worldliness in your life. He's going to make you into a new image. So this is, this is the second way God's glory is put on display through the restoration of his people. It is through cleansing. But then there's another way. There's a third way God's glory is displayed through the restoration of his people, and that is through regeneration. Regeneration. Look down at your Bibles at verse 26. Here God says, And I will give you a new heart, and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh, and give you a heart of flesh. So here, 
we see that in regeneration, well, first, what is regeneration? Regeneration is a word that explains the supernatural work of God that occurs in the life of a believer. It's a supernatural work where God recreates a person's heart. He actually takes out a heart of stone, as he says here, and he gives you a heart of flesh. He gives you a brand new heart. But before we can actually go into that, we have to stop and say, well, what, what is the heart? You know, often when you talk with people, they almost always associate the heart with emotions. People think, say things like, well, I have joy in my heart. Or my heart's in love with fill in the blank. And, and almost every time in people's minds they associate our heart, and when they read in scripture the heart, they think emotions, they think of feelings. But really, that's only a limited way of looking at the heart, and it's not it's not an actual biblical way of what the scripture means when it uses the term heart. So the heart in scripture represents the very center of who you are. It it's all of your thoughts. It's all of your emotions, of course. It includes all of your desires, the things you, you desire. It, it, it represents your very nature. Your, your heart is you. It's who you really are at the bottom of your being. That's why it's absurd to say that you can't know a person's heart because all you have to do is observe how they live, observe the things that catch their attention or what excites them or what they talk about most or, or what their thoughts are consumed by. That reveals what your heart is actually like because your heart is expressed through every part of who you are. And so in scripture, that is what it means when it says the word heart. But here we see that God says he's going to remove a heart of stone. He calls it a heart of stone. And so now we have to ask, well, what is a heart of stone? Well, for that, I have three, three um, passages that I'm going to read quickly. So for those of you taking notes, these are just three quick summaries that describe what a heart of stone is like. So the first is Jeremiah 17.9. Here, Jeremiah says that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick, who can understand it? In Ecclesiastes 9.3, at the bottom part of verse 3, it says that the hearts of the children of man are full of evil and madness is in their hearts while they live, and after that, they go to the dead. And then the final one is Genesis 8, verse 21. It says, When the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, he said in his heart, Never again will I curse the ground because of man, even though every inclination of his heart is evil from its youth. And never again will I destroy all living creatures as I have done. So there you can see the pattern. A heart of stone is deceitful. It's desperately sick. It's full of evil and madness. It's evil from its youth. So really to boil it all down, a heart of stone is a heart that doesn't respond to God. It's a heart that, that reflects Israel and their actions. How You know, Israel, when you read the Old Testament, Israel's always kind of like, almost like a candle flame, just always flickering about. One moment they're, they're being faithful and obedient, the next moment they're in complete rebellion and turn into idolatry. And in Scripture, it says that our hearts are dead, that we have a heart of stone. And so in order for us to actually live out the Christian life, we need a new heart. Because he says in here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to remove the heart of stone and I'm going to give you a heart of flesh. So if a heart of stone is unable to respond to God, then what is a heart of flesh? Well, a heart of flesh is a heart that does respond to God. You may have heard this many times before, but 2 Corinthians 5.17 Paul makes a declaration saying, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. So there's a passing away of your old self, and there's a recreation of the new. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 3 and 5, Paul writes, Among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body, and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Interesting, when he says there, desires of the body, the mind, 
and he includes nature, he's really just describing the heart. He's summarizing. Those are all aspects of your heart. He's saying we carried out the desires of our body and the mind and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. So regeneration, as we can see, is that doctrine where God replaces your heart of stone. He takes a heart that won't respond to him, a heart that doesn't delight in him, a heart that just can't find pleasure in him. I mean, there's no delight. There's no pleasure. You don't have satisfaction in God. You don't wake up in the morning and want to spend time with him. You don't find the word is altogether beautiful and worship in it. You don't have a prayer life. There, your life is not marked out by devotion to him. And he takes that heart of stone and he gives you a heart of flesh. It's a living heart. It's an active heart. It's a, it's, a, it's a heart that for the first time in your life, you can see God's glory, God's beauty displayed in the cross of Christ. It's no longer foolishness. It's the power of God. And so I have a few questions for you. Can you say with Paul that from the moment you have put your faith in Christ that your old self has passed away and behold, the new has come? Can you say that? Has there been such a transformation in your life that you can honestly say that, that you have died and you're now experiencing newness of life, new affections, new desires, a desire to want to live and obey God, not out of a, a, a begrudging duty or task, but out of, a, out of a free desire because you love him? Is that a reality in your life? Because God's glory is designed, the salvation, God's salvation that he provides is so awesome that it's designed in such a way that his glory is displayed through his people. There should be such a change in your life that those around you will take notice and they'll be able to mark it down that this person has changed. They may not understand it. They may not be able to articulate it. But the fact is, is they will recognize a change in your life. And so this is the third way that God's glory is displayed through the restoration of his people. It is through regeneration. It is through receiving a new heart. But there's a fourth and final way that God's glory is put on display through the restoration of his people. And that is through indwelling. And dwelling. Look down in your Bibles at verse 27. He says, And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. See, when a person is born again, when a person truly put, places their faith in Jesus Christ, the Spirit of God now indwells that person. He lives inside of you, He indwells the believer. We, we see this all over the place, but it's highlighted specifically in the Gospel of John where Jesus is talking to his disciples. Before Jesus left and was ascended up into heaven where he would leave his, his disciples behind, this is what he says in John 16, 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go I will send him to you. So this is one of the unique truths of Christianity. Not only does God save his people, but he also indwells his people. Another one in the Gospel of John is chapter 14, verse 17. Again, Jesus speaking with his disciples, he says, Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. So this is an amazing promise that God is going to indwell his people and he will not leave them alone. He will be with his people at all times. So much so that Jesus can even promise in the Great Commission that, lo, I will be with you always to the end of the age. And when he promised that, 
Right after that, we hear that he ascended up into heaven. So how could Jesus promise that he's going to be with them to the end of the age if he's physically leaving them to go sit at the right hand of the Father? It is because of times like these when Jesus promised that the Spirit would be with them. But that Im immediately raises questions. How do we know that the Spirit of God is in us? How do we know that the Spirit of God is actually in us, that we have received him? Because a lot of people, if, if you ask, they, they would tend to rely on feelings. They would say things like, well, I, I feel the presence of God. Or, or they might say that, you know, I, I can sense God's love in my heart. Or I can feel God's love. They, they say things like these. But we don't want to just base our assurance of having God's spirit indwell in us based on how we feel. Because using that candle illustration I used earlier about Israel, feelings are the same way. They, they can just flicker around. One moment you could be filled with joy and happiness or maybe have confidence. And then a moment later, it could be the exact opposite. So we have to ask, how do we know that God's spirit is in us? For that, I have three things, and this isn't an exhaustive list, but these are three things in which we can know and have assurance of being born again and God's Spirit actually indwelling us. The first is that the Spirit produces fruit. The Spirit produces fruit. We see this in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. Paul writing says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. So here we're given fruits, but, but what, they, what they really are is just character. It's character. It's, it's how through sanctification God grows in you a deeper love for him and for people. He, he creates joy in you. He creates peace and, and, and patience and, and kindness. And, and he creates a, a, a character in you which he can say against such thing there is no law. There's no need for a law if you live this way perfectly. So these fruits, they're, it's the work of the Spirit in you. In Ezekiel 36, when we read in verse 27, it says, I will put the Spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. So here, the fruit of the Spirit is the work of God causing you, I'm sorry, causing you to walk in his statutes and be careful to obey his rules. It's causing you to be obedient. And as one of the signs we can know if we received the Spirit, is, is there a progression in our obedience towards Christ? Not perfectly, but is there growth as we look over the span of our Christian walk? The second way we can know we have received the Spirit is we're told that the Spirit illumines our minds. We see this in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 12 and 14, where Paul says, Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. And we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. So what he is saying here is the way you know you receive the Spirit is the Spirit will illumine your mind. You'll basically be able to say with Paul when he said that the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. So one of the great signs that the Spirit of God is in you is no longer do you see the Bible, God's Word. No longer do you see the message of the gospel, the good news that Jesus died for sinners. You don't see that as foolish anymore. You see it as the very power and glory of God because the Spirit illumines your mind to see these things as true and see them as altogether lovely. And so that's the second way we can see that God's Spirit is in us. But then there's a, there's a third and final way that we can see this, and that is that the Spirit guides and teaches you. So he guides and teaches you. In the Gospel of John again, chapter 16, verse 13, Jesus speaking to his disciples says, When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. 
For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he'll declare to you the things that are to come. So there Jesus promises that the Spirit will guide you into truth. Another way of saying that is the Spirit will guide you into the Word of God, where the truth of God is found. Another quick verse is John 14, 6. Again, Jesus speaking with the disciples. He says, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. So that's the ministry of the Spirit, that the Spirit works in you to not only illumine your mind, but to teach and guide you according to God's word, to bring to remembrance things found in the word. And so those are three real practical ways to know if we have the Spirit. Is the Spirit producing fruit in your life? Is it producing character? Is the Spirit illuminating your mind to receive God's word? Is altogether beautiful and glorious? Is the Spirit guiding and teaching you? Are you learning the word through the help of the Holy Spirit? And so this is, this is the final way we have seen that God's glory is displayed through the restoration of his people. That he will indwell his people by his Holy Spirit and cause them to walk and be careful to obey his rules. So in summary, God is designed to work a salvation to be such that when a person is truly saved, God's glory is put on display through that person. In fact, God has so much passion for his own glory that he guarantees the outcome and the restoration of his people. Now, I don't know if you noticed this, but when you go back through this passage, I just want to emphasize something here for you. I want to emphasize what God says he's going to do. He begins by saying, I will take you from the nations. He says, I will gather you from all the lands. I will bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone from out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and I will cause you to walk in my statutes. But not only does he tell us that he is going to perform every part of the restoration of his people, but he also declares that he guarantees the outcome of that work by following up by saying, you shall be clean. You will walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. You will dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers and you shall be my people and I will be your God. So I hope we can see here today that God's glory is put on display through the restoration of his people. Through those who place their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, God's glory is shown through them in these four ways. He does it through separation. He does it through cleansing. He does it through regeneration. And he does it through indwelling. And all of it is for the purpose of putting on display God's glory through the restoration of his people. Well, Father, I just give thanks, Lord, for your word. Lord, your word is true, and I, I pray, Father, that, um, that we would be convicted where that needs to happen. I pray we would be encouraged, Lord, if we can see your work in our lives. I pray for those who have listened to this message, Lord, that um, your word would, would bless them. And Lord, that we would all be helped because that's all we have is your word. And Lord, I, I pray that um, as God's people, after hearing this message, that we would rejoice, that we would have joy in the fact that your glory, Lord, your name is being lifted up through the work that you do in our lives and that only comes about through the restoration that we receive through the finished work of Jesus Christ. So, Father, thank you. I pray you bless us and keep us. In Jesus' name, amen.